Hi, welcome back to our continuing look at Hannah Arendt's text, The Human Condition. Here we are for chapter two of the text, The Public and the Private Realm. So in chapter one, we articulated something about the human condition in terms of the active life, the vita activa. And we looked a bit at the different types of human activities that Arendt identifies and how they corresponded to different types of lives that humans could lead. And she wanted to tease out specifically some sort of notion of the political life, because in the second chapter, she's going to take a bit more of a look at her concept of the public sphere, specifically contrasting what she means by the public, of with the public um, against that of the private, and very important in this chapter, and why we needed to understand the context for the political life, is that Arendt is going to draw a distinction sort of within the notion of the public between the concept of the political and that of the social. And the social is something strange because, in a sense, it stands with a foot on either side of the public-private split. So... That is why in this section, section four, yeah, she, she titles it man. Again, not a gender term, yeah, uh, referring to humans in general, but a social or a political animal. What are we? That is the question we're looking at. And again, what is this distinction between the social and the political? So Aaron begins the text or the chapter, sorry, by reminding us that we are conditioned beings, that we exist, and we spoke about the notion of the world, as opposed to the earth, which is the natural environment, and the world, which is artificial. That is something that we've created as a common shared space with um, other human beings, mostly the product of, of work. Um, but it's necessary to, to sustain action and human activity um, exists in this reciprocal relationship with the world so that we, as I said in previous sessions, we condition and are conditioned by this world. And this world makes possible um, human activity, but human activity is also important in sustaining that world, again, this reciprocal relationship. And a very important element about this is the fact, like I said, it's a common world. It's something that binds human beings together and makes or, or, or makes an aspect of our existence public. And that's why I said, yeah, the world is inescapably informed by the plurality of human beings. Now, yeah, plurality is preferring, again, specifically to plurality in, in its relation to human action, but also plurality to the extent that it extends to work, as I, as, as I said Work is very important. The products, the artifacts that work uh, produces are important in preserving the common world. And again, the roads that get paved, the buildings that get constructed. You know, we need someone to build the parliament building so that the legislator can get together and deliberate all their, their laws and, and whatnot. Um so plurality, and obviously not a single person builds any one of these things. It's humans operating together. Um, and even to some extent, labor is plural, but um, perhaps that is more appropriately described as social, as we'll see moving forward. But Arendt writes here that no human life, not even the life of the hermit in nature's wilderness, and I've put here in brackets just to add maybe a little twist, given what we said in the previous session, um, or the philosopher in eternity's contemplation. Again, I mentioned contemplation as being um, or requiring a withdrawal from the public. Um, but that is not possible without a world which directly or indirectly testifies to the presence of other human beings. Plato, in his construction of his ideal city, the Calipolis, wants to, to place the, the philosopher kings at the apex. And Aristotle concludes the Nicomachean ethics by saying that the contemplation is the highest good. But even if we create a society oriented at allowing 
at least some of its citizens to engage in contemplation. It That contemplation requires the infrastructure, the activity of all these people working together in order to make that possible. Even the hermit, the, a hermit out in the wilderness, still um, alludes to the fact that they had a parent, right? The hermit didn't pop out of the ground. Uh, they, they at least had a mother, probably also a father. Maybe you want to contend. What if they were, um, you know, what if we want to get, you know, speculative, speculative fiction up in here and suggest that uh, they were created in some laboratory? That would still testify to the presence of other human beings. Um, but again, we should perhaps not get too confused between the notion of plurality and multiplicity here. Again, plurality has more to do with the, the uniqueness of each human being. But, and, and we, we spoke about the idea of not understanding human beings as repetitions of a form. And that goes to that tension we discussed, I think, in the first video and I've, I've, or the second video, and I've, I've put this here at the bottom of the slide, condition versus nature. What we are intrinsically versus how we sort of develop in reaction to our circumstances. And this distinction is important to keep in mind for, for Arendt, at least, as she progresses with this chapter, because she wants to articulate her understanding of the distinction between the political and the social through a look at Aristotle's definition of the human being, specifically two definitions he provides in his text, one of the human as the zoon politikon, zoon meaning animal, so the political animal, and the zoon logon. And logos can mean different things, reason, speech, uh, giving an account. Um, so what that term specifically means, or what aren't going to argue that it means, I'll we'll divulge later. But her argument is essentially going to be that Aristotle here yeah, was not positing something about human nature per se, what we intrinsically are, but was at least gesturing towards an, a dimension of human existence which in, inescapably informs us, conditions us. Um, and it's very important for her to pay attention to what exactly he means by these experiences, by or by the the experiences that these terms denote. So let us look then at the first term, the first concept, the zoon politikon, as I said, the political animal. And again, Arendt is attentive to the meanings of words and she looks at how words get uh, translated. And yeah, I'm thinking, I'm, I'm reminded of Alistair McIntyre and what he says uh, specifically in Whose Justice, Which Rationality, about the translation of ideas and concepts between different traditions. And not necessarily just the translation conceptually, but also translation in terms of the language that's used. And here Arendt notes, again, in the translation of a concept from the Greek meaning to a Latin meaning, that something gets altered along the way. We spoke previously about the the translation of the, um, excuse me, the bios politicos to the vita activa. And though the terms do have some unified meaning or common meaning, they ultimately point to something different in our interpretation. And it's the same here between the zoon politicon and the animal socialis, the Latin term for a social animal. And initially, this seems like a reasonable association to make, given what we just said about plurality. But again, this uh, subtle difference in, in meaning between what Arne's going to point out between the social and the political gets obscured and we lose again a sense of action as having a strictly political sense, or a predominantly political sense, I should say. So the point to emphasize, yeah, that Arendt wants to emphasize is that the social, or at least what she understands by what the term social implies, 
is not to be confused with the political. And though the two terms relate to a sort of uh, plural existence, a sort of communal existence, or public existence, I should say, is an important distinction. And the distinction goes to this. She talks here that the natural association of the, quote, merely social companionship is centered in the oikos, the Greek term meaning the home, um, and the family. And this being the location of our private lives, what is our own, the idiom is the Greek term here. So this, if you remember what we said about the distinction between the realms of necessity and the realms of freedom, this is now sort of developing upon that distinction. The realm of the oikos, the home, is our private life. This is your family life where you live with your parents or with your kids or your spouse or whoever it is that you're staying with. And we could think of this in the classic Greek sense, right? You had the part of familias, and I'm applying a Latin term, but you had the head of the household, which was the Athenian man, or whichever city-state you want to pick. And then he had his wife and children and all the slaves that lived in the house. And this private realm that um, was your own or the own of the household head they ruled in a very despotic manner and this goes back to discussions you'll see in, in Plato and Aristotle as well though Arendt is perhaps drawing a much more definitive uh, split than they necessarily do in their philosophies but if you think about the way a household operates right the man traditionally speaking the man rules the household in a very tyrannical fashion or at least in, the, in a very monarchical fashion, maybe I should put it that way, the rule of one. Um, a lot of men still hold the idea today that they are the they wear the pants in the family and the wife should be subordinate and take their, their key from them. That was obviously the case in Greek society. We might quibble with that understanding uh, rightly. So today, though it is going to... Um, be very interesting how we're going to make that argument if we want to make it along Orientian terms, but I'll leave that for as the argument or as the concepts unfold. We might think of slaves, right, and the way that um, a master ruled over the slaves in their household, and though again, rightfully, we might reject slavery today, um, we could think of domestic workers, right, maids or gardeners or something to that effect that a lot of people today or at least in the country I live in, in South Africa, the domestic workers are very popularly, commonly used by people. Your mileage may vary depending on your country. But, I mean, it's not like people hire domestic workers and then vote about what they're going to do. They give the orders um, and they expect the orders to be followed properly. We might also think of children. And yes, the, the instance where we might be more willing to uh, suggest that the parent does have a large degree of authority, uh, um, appropriate authority, though obviously the authority that a, a parent exercises over, over their child wanes the older the child gets. But that dimension of rulership, the way that um, a family is structured, is very different, at least for Arendt and conceptually maybe for um, much of, of human history a lot of societies or a lot of communities I should say have thought this way um, this is very different from how we interact with each other or how different families interact with each other and yeah we Aaron talks about the second life granted by our participation in the polis that is the political life and this is the life that is properly communal, koinon being the Greek word, that life that we share with others. And again, this goes back to that distinction I made between the lives of necessity and the lives of freedom. So where the oikos, the home, the family home, is the realm of necessity. And we'll get to this more later. But it's, um, it's the society that happens there, the companionship that happens there happens because we need to work together in order to live. We need no man is an island, again, to reiterate that phrase. And you can even think about what Aristotle and Plato say about the reason why 
um, human communities are formed, they think that initially they formed out of necessity, out of the need to provide subsistence, that you have a sort of cooperation and perhaps a division of labor required to ensure that all the activities that need to happen get done. But Arendt is going to refute this later where she denies that this is properly speaking why the polis was founded. This is more properly speaking to her why the family exists. The family exists as a unit for sub, uh, subsistence. And the family could be incredibly big. We might think of hunter-gatherer societies or nomadic societies in the past where it was, in a sense, extended families uh, that, that lived together. Um, and this realm of necessity, as we said, where you need to sort of liberate yourself from it, you need to step beyond the realm of necessity in order to step into the political realm, where it's properly speaking the realm of freedom, because here you exist as a free citizen among other free citizens. And here we might, again, um, take note of the notion of something like personhood, um, that that's why we talk about a second life, that there's a different kind of existence that you step into when you step out into a world of equals. And here it's preferably not monarchy that operates, but polity. It would be um, the Aristotelian term, politeia, um, or a good form of democracy, right? So the social then is rooted in that familial um home it is sort of like an extension of the family conception into the public world where the political is more properly speaking in a sense the true public the real public the real communal life the real embodiment of plurality and why what distinguishes part of what distinguishes the political from the social um are two principal activities. One of them is action, and the Greek term, yeah, um, uh, points out, is praxis. But very importantly, speech. Um, and perhaps the word lexis here doesn't convey the full meaning of what Arendt is trying to indicate, but it is necessary to point out that um, speech, in a sense, is a type of action. Um, as I'm going to point out now, there's a deep interdependency between these two activities. And I've mentioned this before, but speech here doesn't just mean making noises with your mouth or, or you know, just trying to communicate very brute information. Speech is very much more than that. For Aaron, speech can be performative. Speech can be deliberative. Speech is about disclosing our identities. Speech is about preserving history. There's a whole, um, let's say, practice or set of practices that are associated with speech or that um, are speech, for lack of a better way of, of articulating it. And speech is very important, a very important part of plurality, the need that we have to be able to um, communicate, and not just communicate fact, but communicate meaning, right? And yeah, I return you to the first uh, prologue discussion but communicate meaning amongst each other. And speech is very much essential in sustaining the political life, though in a sense the political life exists in order for speech to occur, speech now being, in a, being used in a very technical sense. And that's why Aaron talks here about speech and action as being considered co-evil and co-equal, because most political action, insofar as it remains, and she writes here, outside the sphere of violence, is indeed transacted in words. Um, and she talks in the text about how speech gets elevated, perhaps disproportionately so, though we can quibble about that later, um, speech gets elevated as the political activity par excellence, specifically rhetoric. And you know, we can go all the way back to Plato, yeah, and, and Socrates' gripe with the sophists and, and what they're getting up to and his interrogation of the orator, orators and what oratory is supposed to be about. Um, but speech as persuasion was how you got things done in the political life. It is what, you know, to maybe exploit a term, yeah, it is what civilized man does, right? And violence is something that occurred outside the polis. Violence was something 
that you that is relegated to the private sphere for one right it is the violence necessary in order to ensure that the necessities are looked after it's the violence that a husband exerts on his wife and children and slaves in order to make sure that they obey um I should perhaps point out at this stage, Arendt is not necessarily condoning this. She's not saying that this is necessarily how things should be. But she's suggesting that underlying the reality of how a lot of these things played out was a certain understanding of the structure of things, right? And um, if you think about the way people operate in their homes, even today, a lot of people still insist that what happens behind the closed doors is their business and neither the state nor their neighbours have any right to stick their grubby mitts in people's personal business. And to some extent there is merit to that. Um, we need to be reasonable about how intrusive we are into people's, you know, into what is a person's own. Um, but Arendt also writes here about violence as only sheer violence is mutual rights. And for this reason, violence alone can never be great. So here she's trying to dissuade any sort of misperception that violence is political, is a political activity. And this is, and, and she'll um, say more, more about this later, but this is to stand in very direct defiance to a more modern notion of what the state is supposed to do. Uh, think about Thomas Hobbes, right? The idea that the state holds a monopoly on violence and it uses that violence in, in, in order to preserve the integrity of the state. Arndt just almost wants to say that is completely the opposite of what a state is supposed to achieve. The state begins where violence finishes. Um, or at least that's what she's saying in terms of how she understands a classical conception of things. I mean, we might want to argue with her about this, given how important military training was um, in ancient Greek society. Again, Plato has Socrates having discussions about what courage entails. Think of the, the Lachis. Um, or even what Alcibiades himself talks about, um, Socrates' performance on campaign. And... But the distinction here, I think, that might swing in Oren's favour is there's a difference between the violence that occurs between polices, between different states. That violence, in a sense, is appropriate because it is occurring outside the polis, as it were, one's own polis. Um, and that's very different from violence that would occur within the polis, as it, um, as it were, between different um, homes or different oi and I'm suddenly blanking on the plural of that word. Um, civil war is abhorrent. It, civil war is the complete disintegration of the state. Um, and, uh, we, you know, contemporarily we could think about protests. Uh, yeah, in South Africa, we've, we've been, especially yeah, where I am, we've been dealing with a lot of student protests recently, though that sort of is an annual thing at this stage. You could think in America about Black Lives Matter protests and the accusations that get levied against these protests in relation to their use of violence. Now we could say what Aaron says here and say, but violence is mute. Um, protests are ineffectual. But in a sense, what's happening here in these protests is it's the, you know, the product of a disintegration of the polis, of the political life. These groups, um, you know, whether it's underprivileged students or uh, black people living in America, um, they feel that they've been robbed of speech. They have been robbed of the opportunity to step forward into the public and express their, their experiences, disclose their, their identities and reveal what it is they're going through and try to seek some measure of, of justice. So they have to resort, they have been muted by themselves. And because violence is mute, that is all that is left for them to turn to in order to express themselves. And this is, again, indicative of a breakdown of um, the political realm. It is not supposed to be what the political realm is about. And the fact that things get to that point 
should, in, rather than condemning the protests, um, though, you know, the circumstances depending, the, the question should be, what has happened to the political realm? What has happened to the public sphere that, have, that things have devolved to, that, to this point? That should be the important question to ask. Um, I've <laughs> digressed a bit much here, but um, I hope what I'm saying is making sense. But let's turn now to the other definition that Aristotle offers about the human being, and that is the zoon logon. And here Arendt notes that it is to be translated, in her opinion, as the animal capable of speech. Here, logon or logos referring to speech. So yeah, this is developing on what she has said now about the importance of speech to the political realm. And again, she notes the translation in Latin to animal rationale or the rational animal. And she's arguing that this, once again, just as the Vita Activa added to the obfuscation of the Bios Politicos and as Animal Socialis added to the obfuscation of the Zuon Politicon, so this understanding of Zuon Logon as the rational animal is misleading um, for her because... Again, turning to what, to what Aristotle himself discusses, she notes, Aristotle meant neither to define man in general, nor to indicate man's highest capacity, you know, that reason is the highest faculty in, in the human being. And if you know something about Aristotle's moral psychology, you'll know what she's referring to here. But, you know, she writes that what the highest capacity was for Aristotle was not strictly speaking the logos, that is not speech or reason, but nous, the capacity of contemplation, whose chief characteristic is that its content cannot be rendered in speech. And again, the word here is arreton, which we saw earlier when we were speaking about contemplation and that experience, that almost unspeakable mystical experience that the perception of or the apprehension of truth entails. But what Arendt is suggesting here is, is correct, that for for. As, as I said, at the end of the Nicomachean Ethics, Aristotle points to contemplation as the highest type of human activity. And it's the nous, the mind, um, the highest faculty of the mind that um, that is responsible for that apprehension. And if we wanted to understand um, what the human being is, it would perhaps be more correct then to talk about it as the zoon Nuon or the Zuon Noeticon or something to that effect, not the Zuon Logon, because for Arendt the Zuon Logon indicates speech, not just reason. So again, a much more specific notion of things. Now she might be a bit, I must admit, I think Arendt might be a bit too narrow in what she's suggesting here. Again, we should perhaps note that speech itself is Speech and action both require rationality. There's a sort of a nesting going on here. Action is a type of rational activity and speech is a type of action. So saying that um, the human being is an animal capable of speech innately implies that they are a rational being. But Arendt is trying to point out to something very specific here and it goes to what we've been saying about the notion of the relationship between speech and politics. And she notes that when Aristotle defined slaves and barbarians as anu logos, um, he meant neither that they were entirely irrational or incapable of speech, but that they lacked the way of life, the, po the polis, which made action possible. Now, again, I think Arendt might be being a bit too narrow in, in her interpretation. It's certainly part of what Aristotle is saying, don't get me wrong. Um, but just to, to articulate or ex explicate what she's saying, if we think about, you know, the ancient understanding of slaves, it wasn't necessary that slaves were entirely without reason or without rationality. They had to have rationality to the extent that they could follow the orders of the masters. But the argument was that slaves lacked sufficient rationality in order to make decisions for themselves, in order to be capable of deliberation and Demonst scientific demonstrations, sort of higher level, <laughs> for higher order reason. That's not a term she employs. I'm just throwing that out here. Um, and obviously, 
the slaves are not incapable of speech. They can understand you. Um, but rather what, what this term imply, Im, implies is that slaves and barbarians don't have a political realm. They have a social realm per se, because as I said, you know, you have these communities where that are sort of extended families um, where you have some chief or head, um, which is sort of like a ruling family within the community. And then you have the, the extended family radiating out. And it's very much organized in that way. And this is sort of how slave um, barbarians are understood as, as um, um, organizing their, their societies. But this is not a polis. This is not political life. Again, this is not necessarily accurate to how these communities actually were flourished, right? If we could think about the type of speech that goes into communities that Aristotle, Plato might not necessarily have classified as being um, political communities. These communities have oral traditions. They have um, communal councils and things like that where something resembling speech in the way that Arendt is employing the term, is being practiced, though the community itself might not necessarily be structured in terms of the political community. Um, but this is the distinction to an extent that Arendt is trying to make between the political and the social and what these two, these two concepts explicitly mean. So a lot has been said to just wrap up the main points the important point to note is that, again, plurality is a condition of human life and much of what we do is going to be for, informed by the fact that we live amongst other human beings and have to engage with them. And this means that we can draw a distinction between two realms of human existence where different types of activities might play different roles. One is the realm of the oikos, the home, which is our private life and that of the polis, the political life. And this, for Arendt, is more properly speaking, the public life per se, the public sphere. Though there are two ways of conceptualizing the public, and these are not identical, being the social and the political, where the social has its roots in the private realm, while the political, as I said, is more properly speaking, a public. Um, and Again, just to re-emphasize, the two types of activity that characterize political life and make it unique are speech and action. And these two obviously are connected. And this is really important. It's really important to, to note what she's saying here about speech and action, what it does, because again, a very important aspect of the political realm is its relation to human biography and human uh, communal history and, and the preservation of the life of those who are part of the community. But this has been um, our first look into chapter two. Join me next week when we continue our dive into Hannah Arendt's theory of the public sphere. Until then, take care.